My name is Mike Plummer, and I, I work for in Uni University of Illinois Extension for 34 plus years. So I'm on a corn soybean rotation chemical system. So that's what we'll pretty much emphasize on this thing. Um, and they've at, that's what the other two speakers didn't cover this, so that's what I'm supposed to cover. So uh, the one thing that I think we need to bring up, and, and uh, Jeff just mentioned it right there at the end, there are a lot of different varieties of the cover crops. You just don't buy rye, you buy a variety of rye. There's 20 some different varieties of rye out there, cereal rye. So you, you buy one that does what you want it to do or one that's selected. We can get shorter ones, we get taller ones, we got some that are more allelopathic than others. Uh, some have different growth habitats, some tiller better. There, there's a lot of different varieties out there. So there's a lot of work being done on that, a lot of developments being done. I know South Dakota is working really hard on new varieties for cereal rye for a lot of different issues. VNS, I need to mention, variety not stated. That's a brown bag with, nothing, with something in the bag you don't have a clue what it is. Um, and what we're finding is, is the more cover crops we utilize, the more we find that we have no clue what's in the bag. Uh, it can be anything, it can be a combination of things, it can be three different varieties of cereal rye or three different types of, of crimson clover, we don't know. The way you find out about that is you go back to your seed source, your dealer, and your dealer should be telling, buying specific varieties or quality of seed. And that's what we need to do. We've got to do that. We're running into a lot of issues that uh, we're getting varieties mixed in the same bag that have two different maturities. They're growing at different rates. They're breaking dormancy at different times. They're growing different speeds and height in the spring. We don't know what's in there. The seed dealers should know, uh, and some of them do know because they're doing it. And when I originally started working with ryegrass, the first variety I tested had six varieties in it with five weeks difference in maturity. And so how hard is it to kill a variety that comes up three weeks apart in the spring? Breaks dormancy up to three weeks difference. It doesn't. <laughs> It's impossible. So, so you need to be able to spray them when you, when you need to spray them. I think they've pretty well covered that. Uh, you decide with whether you're going to produce nitrogen. Your vetch, the longer it grows, the more nitrogen it produces. Crimson clover, the longer it grows, the more nitrogen it produces. Most of the nitrogen is in the top growth. If you want root growth, typically on our grasses, once they set joints, the depth on the rooting slows down or it doesn't occur anymore. We get surface rooting, but not more depth. So this is a little bit different. Uh, and we control, again, you pick the variety that works the best and you plant it dense enough so that, it, that it's there and you spray it for what your weed control. Uh, Steve pretty well explained all that on, on cereal rye. Uh, on soybean guys, we normally wait late and let it get large so we get better weed control out of it. Uh, I always tell people if they're in a herbicide applications, you always consider multiple applications. And on tough species, we recommend two applications. So you need to be prepared. You may not need to. Uh, consider non-glyphosate control options. We're really pushing hard in cover crops to not use glyphosate more than once a year or every other year. So we want to get away from the glyphosate as much as we can. Otherwise, we're going to develop tolerance in our cover crops to the glyphosate. So we need to be aware of that. Um, this is what one of my uh, farmer friends and that's been doing research trials with me for what? Ralph, you've been 15 years? Um, this is his spray rig, and I put it up here because he built it all from scratch. Um, and it's pretty, pretty slick. Uh, GPS, foam markers, everything on it. And the neat thing about it is he sprays whenever he wants to spray. If it's a wet spring, he still sprays. If it's a dry spring, he uses a normal rig. So if you're going to do cover crops, you need to think of an option that you're going to need to spray when you need to spray if you're managing for a certain height on your cover crop. If you're wanting the nitrogen back out of it, if you want it to break down fast, you've got to spray it when it needs to be sprayed. So you've got to go. 
And that's the whole aspect behind this is uh, you set it up to go when you need to go. This is a quick summary slide and I uh, probably sh should have put this at the end rather than the beginning. One thing we talked about, radish is a winter kill. We know they winter kill in most areas. But now that I work from the Gulf Coast all the way to Wisconsin, I find that once I get south of the confluence of the, of the Mississippi and the Ohio, they don't always winter kill. In fact, two years ago where I lived, they didn't winter kill. So that doesn't mean they're going to winter kill. So you may need to be aware of that. If you're farther south, it's not going to winter kill. CRI, we've used different herbicides. Hairy vetch, the one thing that most people don't realize is glyphosate doesn't work on hairy vetch. It's totally tolerant of glyphosate. We've got a lot of producers that use glyphosate to clean the weeds out of their hairy vetch field so they can get a better stand of vetch. I don't recommend that, but I've seen it done. Uh, 2,4-D kills vetch very easily. You can open a jug and set it in the field and two days later you got a, a vaporization trail down through the field when the vetch is curling up and falling over. It's very, very sensitive to 2,4-D. Annual ryegrass, I'll go into detail on that. Crimson clover as well, um, pretty easy. Spring oats, typically winter kill. Uh, and triticale, normally it's like cereal rye. So we normally don't have too much trouble. It's pretty easy to control, in my opinion. The one thing that we, we got some questions about was brassicas uh, on controlling it, especially now that there's several people starting to develop winter hardy brassicas that will grow all winter long and all into the spring. Uh, what controls them? These are the different classes of herbicides that, that have pretty good effect. We've had no problem at all killing the different brassicas and mustards with, with, the, with these herb, different herbicides. So this worked fairly well. Uh, the carryover issue is probably the biggest thing with brassicas that we've been getting dinged with lately. Last year we got dinged really well. Brassicas are very sensitive to uh, these classic pursuit scepter and mixes and can canopy that can contain the classic or chlorimuron. Uh, very, very, very sensitive and they'll knock them down pretty quickly. And they will carry residue in the fall, especially last year we had late planting. We also had late spraying, and we had some prevented planted acres that we had some guys going out and using canopy because they had it left over because they never got it sprayed in the crop. So they were controlling weeds with canopy, then planting three weeks or four weeks or five weeks later, planting a cover crop, and they were all dying. And so I'm got a lot of phone calls about why are all my cover crops dying, including my ryegrass and my crimson. Uh, it's on prevented planted acres. And I said, well, what'd you do? And he says, well, I, you know, three weeks ago, we sprayed a full rate of canopy uh, with, with classic in it. Uh, so, okay, that makes good sense. They should die. So uh, you got to be aware of that. There's little guidance on the labels, a, a, a real rough rule, rule of thumb, and there isn't any that I can recommend but I've had pretty good luck if I wait at least 60 days. Um, but that's unofficial because it's not on the label. We don't talk about it. Late post applications can kill all, the, all your cover crops with some of the herbicides we've got. So be aware of that. Watch, read your labels, figure out what the label says, and there is some, some guidance in it. Okay, looking at some of them, rapeseed. We've got a number of different rapeseed varieties or, or canolas as, as well, but we've been working a lot with rapeseed because uh, we're controlling cyst nematodes and diseases. Normally on rapeseed, 2,4-D glyphosate works fine, or we use a mix with, with corn herbicides. We can ter normally kill it pretty easily. We don't have too much trouble with rapeseed as a rule. Um, the, is the issue with rapeseed is timing of when you plant it. If you plant it too early, it'll winter kill. If you plant it too late, it winter kills. So that's what we look at. Uh, radishes, what I'm running into now is there's a lot of radishes on the market, and they're not always the radishes you think you want. But you don't ask for a variety, so you don't know. Okay? This is a radish, and 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 they're all planted the same day. Is there a difference between them? Significant. What happened? Guys asked for radishes. I even had one guy ask for radishes and they gave him red globe radishes. 
We got a bunch of red globe seed. So these are these are different radishes. Um, this is one of Steve's radishes. I'll give him a plug. And these are not. <laughs> so all the same day. That's crazy. Uh, crimson clover typically, you know, in full bloom stage, it's really easy to control, and as it's full bloom, it's getting ready to die anyway. So you can do tillage, you can do mowing or crimping, and, and you can do it with herbicides as well. If you're getting more vegetative control, then you can look at some of the, the other combinations of herbicides that we use. Um, we're we tending to pick up more on gromoxone now, just because we're trying to get away from using glyphosate all the time. And we're looking for other options on different herbicides. Um, peas, I don't know if anybody r raises peas. Typically in the Midwest, we don't raise many peas because they don't grow very well for us and we, they, we don't let them grow long enough. Um, I've never had a stand this good in the last 30 years. Um, and this is in a location that there seems to be a corridor right through the center of the the Midwest, like from Indianapolis across where they grow really well. And then we get north and south of that and they don't, they don't grow at all. But it, I'm not going to wait till June to plant my corn and the peas. So we normally don't consider them a viable crop. They're easy to control. The thing is if you start mixing stuff, uh, this is vetch and ryegrass, this is crimson and ryegrass. And if you're going to do that, you, you got to use multiple herbicides, not one, but you're going to have to use combinations to, to do, take care of it. You got to control both things, and they may be different. Because if I used glyphosate on this, I'd kill the ryegrass, but I wouldn't touch the vetch. Well, if I wanted to kill the, the ryegrass and leave the vetch, then I could use glyphosate. And we do that once in a while. Um, but again, here, the bottom's crim crimson and ryegrass, and this is just five days afterwards, so we're, it's moving pretty fast. What about vetch? There's a lot of varieties of vetch, lots. And I had no idea until I started working with vetch and started working with companies. As a general rule in cover crops, we normally do hairy or woolly pod. Uh, they're more winter hardy. They go through the winter in most of the Midwest. Uh, up into Nebraska, they will they survive. 2,4-D is a herbicide of choice because it takes a very low rate of 2,4-D two, and it just smokes vetch instantly. I mean, they go down very quickly. Glyphosate, we get no control. We have used gramoxone and corn herbicides plus the 2,4-D. It works fine. Uh, you already heard about crimping. Uh, common vetch is not normally winter hardy unless we live in the southern U.S. If we get down to Tennessee and south, then common vetch will grow uh, through the winter. Uh, once we get up above the Ohio River, no, it doesn't. It dies when it gets cold. Same way with chickling, uh, it's not winter hardy. And again, we use 2,4-D as a general rule. If you plant vetch as a general rule, you're going to have vetch. That means if I plant it this year, in five years, I probably still have a third of a stand of vetch. Maybe. Depends on the seed and where it came from and how fresh the seed was or if it had been aged for one year or two years before you planted it determines how much hard seeds left in it. That's, that's an issue we run into. So if you plant vetch, you're going to have vetch. Um, and that's fine. Vetch is easy to control. So we don't worry too much about it. Even in wheat, I mean, when I grew up, we sprayed all of our wheat with 2,4-D. I mean, we used 8 to 12 ounces of 2,4-D on wheat for garlic control before we had harmony. And it works fine. You can clean the wheat field up just quick and slick as easy with just a little 2,4-D in the spring. So you don't worry about vetch in wheat. But you better spray it, otherwise you will worry a lot because it'll take over the wheat field. This typical vetch field that we work with, um, that's where I recommend most people. Uh, just a little over knee high, thigh high. It works pretty easily on planting. Uh, you can get through the field doesn't ramp up too bad. The tendrils aren't real long at that stage of growth. Uh, and it, it's pretty easy to, to manage. Contrast that with this. Uh, now you set your planter up to make sure it will run in vetch. Uh, this is in full bloom vetch, so crimper works great here. Uh, plant like this is probably going to kill at least 50% of it, or maybe more. Just the planter running through it, cutting it and crushing it. 
And again, we use 2,4-D on it. It's not a, not a real problem. Uh, but you are going to have wrapping and twisting, and you're going to wrap on any turn and chain and shaft and everything. And one of my farmers tells a story. He planted vetch, and, it, and he didn't take, put shields on some of his chains and some of his shafts. And it, he got a, about 100 yards in the field, and it wrapped up. Uh, got a big ball of hay ro growing in, in the planter. And so he stopped and didn't have a knife with him, and he left his truck at the other end of the field. So he walked all the way back, got his truck, and drove across this vetch, this tall, to get to the tractor. But only he didn't drive all the way across the field because it wrapped his drive shaft and cut his drive shaft in two on his truck. <clears throat> and he still raises vetch. So um, it's quite a deal. I mean, it, you either like it or you don't. Uh, but I like vetch a lot. Vetch, for me, will give the best soil condition in the top 12 inches of any cover crop in one year. It will loosen and fluff that soil just gorgeous in one year. <clears throat> and we get pretty good weed control when we got that heavy a stand. Um, it really, really puts on, put down a really thick cover. And it helps a lot with our weed control. So, nice mulch. What about cereal rye, wheat, and triticale? Uh, a lot of folks still use glyphosate. Uh, we've used gramoxone and atrazine mix. Uh, again, if it's, if it's pollinating, you can crimp it uh, or mow it to help knock it down. Uh, at maturity, once it drops yellow pollen, then you can crimp it. We do, do pretty good. I, I do different than everybody else. I always plant my field first and then, then roll it. Because when I do that, I lay it down and, and I have no trouble getting my depth control and I don't, I'm not cutting any stems. But uh, it's whatever you get used to. Okay, ryegrass. That's the issue that everybody wants to know something about. Uh, I've been working with for about 18 years now. Um, the one thing that blows my mind is as much we've talked about cereal rye and ryegrass in the last 15 years that a major seed corn company put on one of their brochures that they have cereal ryegrass for sale. Now what does that tell me? Well, they didn't edit the brochure, which is not unusual, uh, because I know the company, I know the guys in the company, they know the difference, because they've, they've been on my trials and, and looked at them. But, yeah, th there is a difference. Cereal rye is a grain, rye grass is a forage. Two totally different animals, no comparison at all. This is rye grass, one variety matured. This is another variety of ryegrass that's three weeks behind in maturity, and this is cereal rye fully headed. All planted the same day. There's that much difference in ryegrass varieties. So you gotta understand. There's only, there's only about 172 or three different annual ryegrass varieties, diploids. That doesn't count tetrapoids. So there's a lot of things out there. And my experience has been there's probably about five that are adaptable to the Midwest that do a really good job. And the other 170 are, I wouldn't use. So that, that's an issue. Here's the difference in maturity. This one's already in the drop pollen, set seed, in, in soft dough stage, and this one hasn't even got the boot yet. It's just variety difference planted the same day. So you gotta be aware of that. Now if a seed company, which I know is one company's doing, mix this variety with this variety, what happens? I talked to, to a producer last night. He said, I had a nice stand of ryegrass. I went out and I smoked it, burned it to the ground. Looked pretty. Not a, not a piece of green in the entire field. And two weeks later, I came back and he says, right in the row where I seeded, I've got another stand of ryegrass coming up. It's, they seeded two varieties with, in the same he bought one bag that had two varieties in it. And that's what the problem was. He, did, he got perfect control here. This was just another variety that came up later, broke dormancy later. Just to tell you on how to kill ryegrass, it took me a long time to learn how to kill it because we didn't understand it. 
and now we don't have any trouble. It's pretty unusual if we do. Normally we, we want to kill it before it joints to make it easier and break down quicker. Uh, warm, warm weather will increase it because the herbicide can translocate better. If we're using glyphosate, it's got to translocate. It will not translocate unless the plant's actively growing. And if it's not actively growing because it's too cool, then it doesn't translocate and you don't get control. Pretty straightforward. So uh, we look at different stages of growth. It can be more of a problem at reproductive, and normally that's at boot stage to beginning of boot emergence is when we used to think we had the most problem controlling it because it's going reproductive and it's not really translocating to the crown, it's translocating moving everything to the top. Um, and normally after the second joint, your, your plant's starting to think about growing reproductive, and, that's, and so then we pay more attention on how to control it. The issue that I learned by accident working with, with uh, Mr. Upton uh, was that he sprayed a field in, one day in the morning and they got windy and then, then sprayed it the, that evening. And what was sprayed in the morning was stone dead and what was sprayed in the evening had zero control. So why did that happen? Nobody had a clue until we started looking into it and I actually got uh, contacted a friend of mine in the research at Monsanto and they put me in contact with the man that discovered glyphosate originally. And I spent a half a day with him learning everything there was to know about glyphosate and he said, well of course you didn't get any control, you shouldn't have. And I went, well you say it can spray it and kill stuff. He says, yeah if it's a foxtail plant. But this isn't a foxtail plant. This is an established forage grass. It shouldn't kill it because it's not translocating. It's got to be actively growing to work. To, so the ryegrass will not translocate and move nutrients when the temperatures go below 40 degrees. And if it get a frost, it's going to be three days before that plant gets back into translocating again. So you have a three-day lag. Glyphosate requires four hours at minimum before sunset to translocate and preferably five or six. It takes one hour to get in the leaf, three hours to full, fully translocate in the plant, and a ryegrass plant stops growing one to two hours before sunset to protect itself in cool weather so it doesn't rupture cells. So that means when is the last time I should spray? Four hours plus one, at least five hours is, is better. Four hours would be the absolute minimum, and I would recommend five hours before sunset to get the translocation. And he said the one thing you need to understand is if you spray glyphosate late in the day and it goes through a dark period, 25 to 30 percent of the glyphosate will tie up in the plant tissue. If it's cold and rainy the next day, you'll lose 80 percent of what's left the next day. So you end up with no glyphosate in the plant to control it. It all tied up before it got translocated. So that's the whole thing behind it. Other thing is AMS. There's a lot of substitute products out there and we've used a lot of them. And I, in my opinion, about half of them don't work at all for what AMS is supposed to do. Uh, we want to get rid of the, the minerals in the water that neutralize the glyphosate. Because glyphosate's very tightly attaches to any, any of the calcium, magnesium, iron in the water. So that's an, that's an issue. 10 gallons of water we found that we get the best control between eight and 10 gallons, and we do more water than that, we decrease our control on hard to control plants. We only spray in the morning, earlier in the day, and spray on days that it's sunny, because if it's sunny, the plant's gonna translocate. It's gonna grow. Even when it's cool, it'll grow when the sun's out. If it's cloudy and damp and rainy, it's not gonna grow. And so we're not gonna translocate, so we run the op, the problem in that we could tie up some of the glyphosate in the plant, it won't translocate and, and kill the growing points. So we have started looking at double shot treatments that we used to use in the 80s. In the early 80s, I did a lot of work with no-till with George McKibben, uh, U of I, Dixon Springs, and we were converting fescue to corn production. George was thoroughly convinced you had to plant in the red clover or solid stands of fescue to do no-till. 
And so we found out we could do double shots and kill fescue in the spring. That means we put one herbicide down to knock it down and then we come back two weeks later when the plant starts to recover and starts to regrow and we hit it again. And we find that we do it in ryegrass, it, it takes it out easily, very easily. So we, we can do gramoxone followed by glyphosate, gramoxone when the weather's cold, followed in warmer weather with glyphosate or post grass herbicide. We can do glyphosate early followed by a grass herbicide or another burn down or gramoxone two weeks later followed by gramoxone and residuals in the field. And we get very good control in the 98 to 99 percent control all the time. We've done a lot of herbicide work and what I do is I do, night, I do all my herbicide work with varieties as well because the varieties respond differently to herbicides. So that's one of my typical plots. Um, it's too much, you don't want to do that. Uh, this is just a quick one, just give you a, a, just a piece of some of it. Look at the select max difference. This is cold weather. Uh, select max is, really doesn't translocate at all in cold weather. It hates cold weather. But look at this variety. It was a lot more susceptible to select max. These varieties weren't, didn't show much difference in it. Uh, different combinations, again, if you're going to do one shot on Gramoxone, we never get real good control. Uh, Steadfast is a translocated product. We don't get good control on it either. Uh, Callisto, if you add Callisto or Atrazine to it, we will always reduce our control by 30 to 40 percent, just consistently for the last 10 years because it screws up the glyphosate. Glyphosate doesn't translocate properly when you put Callisto or Atrazine with it. Just another study, uh, again, Gramoxone one shot doesn't do it. Two shots kills it dead. And I'll show you some of that. Here's daytime temperatures that are warm. And this is showing the difference on, on time of day on one study when it's in late April, when we shouldn't see any difference at all. We did it just to see. And we also found out that our pH of our solution makes a difference in control as well. Ammonium sulfate typically will not move the pH of the water below 6.3, 6.4. Depends on how bad it is to start with. And the water I start with on my home farm is 9.3 pH, and it's extremely high in calcium and sodium and iron. So that's a, a real key point. When I, I started doing training with commercial producers uh, and commercial retailers, custom applicators, we found out what they were doing is they typically have a water supply system. Either big hydrant, big lines where they blow the water in the tank really quick. They don't pour glyphosate in the top of the tank. They put it in an inductor. So what do you do if you use raw water that's got a 9.3 pH and you're mixing with an inductor, dribbling it in as you blow it in the tank? That's the most ideal situation I can think of to neutralize as much glyphosate as possible. Right? Why do you use ammonium sulfate if you're going to screw it up before you put it in? So we found that you can fill the tank about 90% full, put the ammonium sulfate in, and then mix it, and then sh blow the, the last little shot in with your, with your glyphosate. So you got the least, you got a high concentration of glyphosate with a small amount of water going into a treated, treated water. That's what we're seeing works the best on those guys. Or we, or if they've got a tank on the truck, we recommend the, the AMS be in the tank on the truck. So they, they're running treated, and then that's, you can run it just normal. This is one, just, just real quick, this is at boot stage. This gramoxone, look at the difference in control. Can you suspect what, why the difference was there by varieties? Growth stage. Huh? Growth stage. I can't hear you. Growth stage. Growth stage, yes. Yeah, because this, this one's an early maturing, real early. This one's fairly early. This is a real late maturing. And so actually the boot was down in the plant. And the, on this one, to get the average, whenever we selected the date to spray, we sprayed them all the same day, which is my, the protocol I wrote for it. But this one was out. It was far more mature. 
And so we got better kill. And it, it goes directly behind the, the maturity of those plants. It does. So sharpen, don't ever use it on small ryegrass because sharpen stops glyphosate totally from working. We got less than 5% control when we put it on, the, on, on six inch ryegrass. And we got that study, this is a study that, that Brian Young, uh, that I, I put together and Brian Young and Andrew Holting from uh, Oregon State did. And again, we'd use varieties, Rootmax, Tam Tebow, Maximus. These two are dip, or, uh, tetraploids. These are diploids. We wanted to find out, can you kill tetraploids? Because everybody told me I can't kill them. Well, we did five trials this last year, and they all died easier than diploid. So I don't know what the issue is. But again, here's some of the glyphosate looking at. There's a little difference, and it's significant based on varieties. So that's what we got to start looking at. That study's available at a, on SIU's website. Here's a, my recommendations where we're looking at split shots, Gramoxone, followed by Select Max. Look at the control. No difference in varieties and good control. Look at Gramoxone and two weeks later, Gramoxone again. We don't need to use Roundup glyphosate. We can control ryegrass without it when we go to split shots or double shots. That's what we're looking at. And we got a lot of other products in there. We're looking at Resolve, we're looking at Zidua, uh, and some of the other. Here's your sharpened one. Do you see that? 2% control, 3%. It stops the glyphosate from translocating. When it's in, this is, this ryegrass, the first node was just coming out of the crown. That's the one that was sprayed, so. Thank you.